Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight at the John Walsh Jersey Shore Chapter of the Irish American Cultural Institute. Um, I'll be your host this evening. Uh, P our chairman, Peter Hallis, is joining us, but may have to drop off, so I'm here in the event that that happens. I'm Maureen Dunphy Brady. I'm an Irish historian, and I'm also a member of the chapter's advisory committee, and I'll do my best to fill Peter's shoes tonight. Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our members. It's lovely to be with you all again, and I'd like to welcome, a special welcome, to any new individuals who are joining us tonight for the first time. We have a very, very special presentation tonight. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Tarlow McConnell. Tarlow is a New York-based exhibition uh, curator, a producer, a writer, and a playwright. He specializes in Irish and Irish American subjects of historical significance. So that's a perfect fit to our mission here at the IACI. Uh, Tarlow has been a longtime contributor to the Irish Voice and the Irish American Magazine. His recent productions include two fascinating online series, including one on Ireland's Great Hunger and the other on Oscar Wilde with Professor Keneally of Quinnipiac uh, University and through other individuals you're gonna to meet tonight. Uh, Tarlow is joined by three esteemed actors. We're so pleased to have them with us tonight. Orla Cassidy, Jarlith Conroy, and Colin Ryan. And it will be a unique evening of storytelling. So going into the old Irish storytelling uh, technique There'll be readings from Turlow's play, The da Wars of Dagger John, but also other selections from different works that will shed light on the story of how Archbishop John J. Hughes led Catholic New York and changed America in the years 1842 to 1864. It's my pleasure to welcome Turlow, Orla, Jarlath, Colin. Thank you all for this special presentation. We look forward to hearing this wonderful uh, review tonight. So thank you. With that, I'm gonna turn off my video and give you the stage, handing it over to you, Turlo. All right, Maureen, thank you. Thank you so much. And it's, um, it's such a pleasure to be here at the Irish American Cultural Institute. I first heard about the Institute, I think maybe about 30 years ago, when uh, Dr. Owen McKernan was writing for Irish American Magazine and writing his own journals. And it was an amazing force in Irish culture. Anyway, it, I'm, I'm glad Maureen says it's storytelling because it would be hard to do a play here, but it's not hard to kind of pull out some monologues and give an idea of the story. And I'm so blessed, as Mr. Yates would say, my glory as I have such friends as Orla, Jarlath, and Colin to help me along, three great actors. And I'm going to tell the audience that or I was just in a one-woman show of Nancy Pelosi in Chicago, which I think is a big deal. And uh, Jarlath is an award-winning actor from Galway, uh, studies at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, appeared at the Old Vic and other theaters. I've known Jarlath for a long time, a great admirer of his work. And Colin, who uh, has just been on so many different shows, and, and, and I'm so pleased he's been in a couple that I've written, and always brings so much to it. But he's appeared on television and film and uh, Blue Blood, Shades of Blue. A lot of them were shot in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. So I know these shows pretty well. Uh, but anyway, so it's great to be in the company of three great actors. And uh, we're gonna tell you the story about uh, John J. Hughes, Archbishop of New York. Uh, the, war the play that, that I wrote, The Wars of Dagger John, uh, was commissioned by the Sheen Center of Manhattan. And uh, the Sheen Center is a, is a, what they call a project of the Archdiocese of New York. Very popular theater has taken off in the last few years. And I'm so grateful to them that they, you know, that they, they gave me the time and the space and the staff to work on this play, which we did. But now we're here at the Irish American Cultural Institute so kind of retelling the story of that. And what we thought we'd do is uh, tell it through the eight pivotal points of his lifetime, his childhood, his immigrant journey, his seminary and ordination as a priest, 
uh, the fact that he was the first Archbishop of New York, builder of schools, orphanages, and hospitals with the help of the Sisters of Charity, the great visionary of St. Patrick's Cathedral, which he never le lived to see, uh, his role in the American Civil War, and of course, the impact of the New York draft riots on him. So to get us started, I've asked Orla to read us a brief overview of the Ireland, uh, no, of the play, just to give you a sense of the play and how it fits into our time. Orla? Thank you, Trilla. The systemic injustice towards people of color continues to outrage Americans. This is not a new story. The play, The Wars of Dagger Job, explores the racism that existed among New Yorkers during the Civil War and one Irishman's struggle to take a moral stand. The thousands of Irish refugees who arrived in New York at the height of Ireland's Great Hunger, 1845 to 1850, embraced Hughes as their leader in their fight to become fully franchised and respected Americans. A generation later, at the height of the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, New York's Irish felt discriminated against by the act of conscription, the draft into the Union Army, which was unfair to immigrants who could not buy their way out. They directed their rage against President Lincoln and the freed slaves flooding New York to compete for their hard-won jobs. Their racist sympathies were a direct challenge to Hughes' leadership. Among the wars the play examines is whether at this volatile moment the aging Hughes can make one last stand and inspire the Irish community to fight for the freedom of African Americans. Hughes' successes and failures, his public relationships and private struggles, and his legacy in the Irish Catholic community enrich the larger history of a nation on the brink of war. New York's first Archbishop, John Hughes, defined himself as a go-getter from the start. By 1847, Hughes, who had arrived from Ulster 30 years before, was already 10 years into his tenure as Bishop of New York, and he still was in his early 40s. Already a public figure fighting for the religious and ethnic minority, he was the most famous Roman Catholic in America, the defender of Catholic institutions in a time of nativist bigotry and church burnings in some parts of the country. His galvanized and protective work and pugnacious style earned him the epithet Dagger John. And it really was because of the knife-like crucifix with which he adorned his signature. The nickname baffled Hughes because he thought of himself only as a shepherd of Ireland's refugees, particularly from the Great Hunger. Yet his impact was far greater than even he envisioned. He was the self-appointed champion of the impoverished Irish. Hughes had a prescience for their future that he helped create and that he ultimately helped reshape America's cities. The play, The Wars of Dagger John, opens with a monologue by Hughes's secretary, Father Francis McNerney, read here by Colin Ryan. Colin. It's 1862. We are on the outskirts of Manhattan on the northern end of the island, about three miles out of town. Our story begins with the foundation stones of the unfinished St. Patrick's Cathedral, which will not be completed for another 17 years. The total population of New York City is around 800,000. About one third of those people are either Irish born or first generation Irish. Why, you ask? The answer is simple. Ireland's great hunger on Gorta Moor late 1840s, Irish famine immigrants flooded into this city. In our play, you will meet Archbishop John Hughes, who over the past 30 years has successfully established the Irish Catholic community in New York. This cathedral should have been a great monument to his legacy, but at this time, this place, this construction site is regarded as his great folly. Instead of a cathedral to rival the world's most magnificent overgrown building site lies abandoned for lack of funding and manpower. Why? Because America is at war with itself. The worst kind of war, civil war. In just a few months, President Lincoln will issue the Emancipation Proclamation to free slaves. Last night, Archbishop Hughes returned 
from a long diplomatic mission to Europe. He was sent there by President Lincoln and Secretary of State William Seward to dissuade the English and the French from interfering in this war by supporting the Southern states. Not that anyone in those countries cares a fig about the troubles in the states. What they care about money, ah. The Archbishop returned a very changed man. This trip took the best of his health, which has not been robust in the past three years. This is the third year of the Civil War. For the Irish American community whose gallant young men proudly enlisted, the war has deteriorated into a nightmare of death and destruction. No one knows this better than families in New York, especially around the Five Points. The city is on edge. If the situation weren't bad enough, it's about to get worse. Archbishop Hughes, who had lifted the Irish from their knees as wretched immigrants and refugees, could not imagine the road ahead. As the leader who placed the Irish on the ladder of success, he was about to lose his flock. Boss Tweed and the Democratic political machine at Tammany Hall. In this time of war, a younger generation cares more about the future than the history of the past. Thank you, Colin. The play outlines the challenges that lay ahead for Hughes and his realization that his great cathedral will not be built in his lifetime. He confides his disappointment to his secretary on the ramparts of the cathedral. And to give you a little bit of that, please welcome Jarlath Conway to read Archbishop Hughes. This will be the challenge for the church of your time, Francis. My time is done. Did you know, Francis, that my first job in this country was on a cotton plantation in Maryland? I didn't last long there. I didn't like slavery then, and I don't like it now. Look over there at the colored orphan museum. See that little girl with the white ribbon in her hair? She's the princess of Fifth Avenue, all smiles breaks my heart to think where she might have come from and how she was treated. I was a slave myself, you know. As a Catholic in Ireland, we had no rights. That was the case until 1829 when Daniel O'Connell won Catholic emancipation. At age 15, I was almost stabbed for being Catholic. Well, think of it, Francis. I was surrounded by a group of Protestant boys. They chased me down a country road and threw me to the ground. One had a knife. He was about to stab me when, thank God, one of the others who knew my father put a stop to it. It's a miracle I escaped with my life. When my baby sister Mary died, the priest wasn't allowed into the graveyard to bless her coffin. I had to bring our priest a handful of clay to bless. Then we could sprinkle that on her grave. Those memories don't leave you. My most vivid memory was as a 19-year-old on a boat to America. All I knew was that I was afloat on the ocean looking for a home and a country where no stigma of inferiority would be impressed on my brow simply because I professed one creed over another. And soon, when this war is over, we will celebrate this vision in this new cathedral on a hill in New York, named for St. Patrick, himself a slave. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to show some images, and hopefully as I do that, I, my PowerPoint is not going to ruin everybody else. So Fran, if you're there, shall I just hit the share screen? Yes. The share screen should allow you to show the power. All right, and then I will go hunting for my uh, PowerPoint, which is here. And now if I hit view slideshow, good, I keep the actors. Did I mess up your scripts, guys? <laughs> you can read, okay, good. All right, well, there's the, I'll point out, there's the crucifix and became his dagger on his name, John Hughes. Um, Not seeing it. 
Oh, you're not seeing the slide? Seeing Ireland now. Oh, okay. Well, then you missed it. I can't go back. Okay. <laughs> I'll send it to you privately. Okay. Um, so here's a map of Ireland. So this is Ulster. And this is where John Hughes was born and raised until he was 19 years of age. And this is his actual home, <laughs> which is preserved in the Ulster American Folk Park in Oma. And if, it's like two rooms, a living room and a, a parlor and a, and a bedroom. And inside that house, there's just one little photograph of St. Patrick's Cathedral. They haven't quite figured out how important he is just yet. But, uh, but it's great that they've kept it and it's in a beautiful folk park. Um, I thought to give an idea of what Ireland was like at the time, uh, I'd look to the work of Cecil Woodham Smith, a fine writer of Irish literature, of Irish heritage, whose book, The Great Hunger, was really the great book that broke through on studies of the Irish famine. And with that, I would ask Orla to just read us the opening of The Great Hunger, because it sets the tone of place that Hughes came from. Orla. At the beginning of the year 1845, the state of Ireland was, as it had been for nearly 700 years, a source of grave anxiety to England. Ireland had first been invaded in 1169. It was now 1845, yet she had been neither assimilated nor subdued. The country had been conquered not once, but several times. The land had been confiscated and redistributed over and over again. The population had been brought to the verge of extinction. After Cromwell's conquest and settlement, only some half million Irish survived. Yet an Irish nation still existed, separate, numerous, and hostile. Indeed, during the last few years, it had seemed that Irish affairs were moving towards a new and alarming crisis. On January 1, 1801, an event of enormous importance had taken place. The act of union between England and Ireland became operative. The two countries were made one. The economy of Ireland was assimilated into the economy of England. The Irish Parliament at Dublin disappeared and the Parliament at Westminster henceforward legislated for both countries. It was as if a marriage between England and Ireland had been celebrated with the clauses of the act of union as the terms of the marriage settlement. The primary object of the Union was not to assist and improve Ireland, but to bring her completely into subjection. So, John J. Hughes left, 19 years of age, and he was determined never to be subjugate, subjugated again to any power. And I think that in that passion, was everything was going to drive him for the rest of his life. Like most Catholics of that time, he headed straight for Maryland because Maryland was the state that was most open to Catholics living there. The prejudices uh, were elsewhere, but Maryland had always been open for Catholics. So Hughes and his entire family uh, moved there. And in Maryland, in the, and actually, in, uh, about 10 miles from where the family lived, um, there lived a woman who was going to play a crucial role in his life. Uh, that was Elizabeth Ann Seaton, um, uh, the American socialite who, became, who founded the Sister of Charity and became America's first native-born saint. Colin, would you tell us about her? Elizabeth Seaton founded the Order of the Sisters of Charity in Emmitsburg, Maryland, located very near what would become the famed battlefield at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It was Emmitsburg where young Hughes began his ambitions for church. His goal was to enter the seminary at Mount St. Mary's, also in Emmitsburg, but nothing about his educational background impressed Jean Dubois, the French-born director and founder of the seminary, as he made clear again and again to his earnest applicants. Nor should Hughes have been surprised by that response. Hughes is described by John Lowry, one of his recent biographers, who says that he looked like what he was, 
a well-built Irish immigrant laborer with a square jaw, a prominent nose, and aspirations beyond his station. His manners were acceptable, his mastery of any one of several academic subjects the school offered non-existent, and his temerity vaguely annoying. Even after Dubois had hired him as the school's gardener and groundskeeper, he would have preferred his Irish-born employee to continue planting, mowing, and trimming, keeping his mouth shut. During those many months, John Hughes learned about patience and anger in equal measure. According to various commentators on Hughes' life, Elizabeth Seton is believed to have interceded with Jean Dubois to get him to reconsider his dismissive attitude toward the young immigrant gardener. The story of her intervention with Dubois is the much quoted line, it took a saint to recognize John Hughes's talent. Years later, Mother Seton's daughter, Catherine Josephine, wrote in response to an inquiry, you ask me something about our archbishop when our gardener, poor old Diedrich, at St. Joseph's convent in Emmitsburg died, Reverend Father Tessier sent the then Mr. Hughes to our dear mother Seton to replace the old man. He said to me, he looks too young and smart for me. I will send him to Father Dubois. So she gave him a note. Sometime after we heard that he had many talents and was going to study for the church. This slide here, this little hut is where Hughes lived when he was a gardener at the seminary. It overlooks the, the seminary down there. And he lived there and it's still there and they take care of it because they know it's an important shrine to John Hughes. He made his reputation there as a student. Uh, his ability to write and to speak as an orator were attributes that would serve him very well as a student but that would continue to serve him well when he went to New York to take up his job at the old cathedral, Jarlath. Hughes had a knack for affiliating himself with men and women who could further his ambitions. Once ordained, Hughes followed Dubois to New York, where the latter became New York's third bishop in 1826. Dubois was in poor health and in 1842, the post went to Hughes, whose accession seemed inevitable. Dubois, a Frenchman, was never popular with his largely Irish congregation. At his request, he was buried under the sidewalk at the entrance to St. Patrick's Old Cathedral on Mott Street, so that people, he would often say, could walk on me in death as they wished to in life. The timing of Hughes's elevation as bishop could not have been better for the Irish, who arrived in droves to escape the great hunger from 1846 onwards. His work as New York's fourth bishop coincided with the migration of hundreds of thousands of refugees from Ireland's great hunger. The indomitable Hughes was right for the job of serving a diocese growing rapidly through the immigration of impoverished Irish. As famine, famine devastated Ireland and revolution ravaged the German states, the newest New Yorkers overwhelmed the jobs and services available. To deal with this tsunami of refugees, Hughes turned to his sister, Sister Mary Angela, for help. She was one of Mother Seton's Sisters of Charity. Over 10 years working with the sisters, they quickly created the first social safety net, an interwoven network of schools, orphanages, hospitals, and homes for the aged. Hughes' success and brashness threatened the Protestant establishment, who retaliated with mob rule and threats of church burnings. The stakes of the conflict rose as Hughes organized his community's immigrant-filled ranks, endorsing political candidates and pressing for public funding of parochial schools. This was not new for Hughes. In 1844, after the torching of a pair of Catholic churches in Philadelphia, New York nativists planned a massive rally. Hughes warned, that attacks on Catholic churches would be met in kind. Alluding to the Russians' scorched earth strategy in their war against the invading Napoleonic army, Hughes cautioned New York's Mayor Harper and nativist municipal officials that if a single Catholic church were burned in New York, the city would become a second Moscow. New York was booming. This is a great illustration of the five points done a little bit earlier. 
and uh, just so much was going on with all of these people arriving, all of these new lives, uh, all of the politics that was emerging from these communities, from the Irish community in particular, and that would blossom right into this huge fanfare of citizenship and citizens would come later. This is a great illustration of a parade on Union Square with Daniel O'Connell being the, the great emancipator of Catholic Ireland in 1929 being um, brought through. The combination of Hughes and the Sisters of Charity was phenomenal. They did so much. And at this point, I'd like Orla to read a letter from Hughes's sister to her friends. My dear friend, we of the Empire City are going on, thank God, prosperously. We have made a purchase for the Mother House, St. Vincent's Sisterhood. At the distance of six miles from the city, a very beautiful spot commanding a charming and extensive view of the East River and surrounding country. There is a frame house whose exterior is almost the same as that of the dear White House in the valley. We will add two spacious wings and open a school, I think the beginning of September. The novitiate is very promising. We cannot receive near the number who wish to enter. Our schools in the city are also doing very well. Sister William Anna has over 90 in hers. Many of these will go with her to the mother house. How are the dear sisters of St. Louis doing? You will do me a favor by naming me very kindly to my many and dear friends. And should any of them seem to wonder that Sister Angela should have transferred her oath of allegiance from the valley to New York, just say that Sister Angela did in that as she would like, did in that as she would like to do in all things. She acted consistently. I send you a lecture that has been delivered in aid of suffering Ireland by our right reverend bishop and brother. Most likely you have already seen it copied in the journal, but this is in neater form. A lecture on the antecedent causes of the Irish famine in 1847 delivered under the auspices of the General Committee for the Relief of the Suffering Poor of Ireland at the Broadway Tabernacle, March 20th, 1847. The year 1847 will be rendered memorable in the future annals of civilization by two events, the one immediately preceding and giving occasion to the other, namely Irish famine and the American sympathy and succor. A sympathy has, in its own right, a singular power of soothing the moral suffering of the forlorn and unfortunate. There is no heart so flinty but that if you, are, if you approach it with kindness, touch it gently with magic wand of true sympathy, it will be melted like the rock of the wilderness, and tears of gratitude on the cheeks of the sufferer will be the prompt and natural response to those of interest, of pity, of affection, which in imagination he will have discovered on yours. Who will say that Ireland is not an unfortunate sufferer? But since her sufferings have become known to other and happier nations, who will say that she is forlorn? America offers her not a sympathy of mere sentiment and feeling, but that substantial sympathy which her condition requires. When the first news of your benevolence and of your efforts shall have been wafted across the ocean, it will sound as sweetly in her agonized ear as the voice of angels whispering hope. It will cause her famine-shrunken heart to expand again to its native fullness whilst from day to day the western breezes will convey to her echoes of the rising song, the swelling chorus, the universal outburst, in short, of American sympathy. Thank you, Jarlath. This, this painting here, I, I saw this painting up at the Mount, which is the convent of the sisters up in Riverdale, and they tell me that the painting was actually commissioned a hundred years after the arrival of the sisters in New York. And it was commissioned and given to them as a gift by a leading Irish uh, business community leader called Honest John Kelly, 
who was apparently the man who cleaned up Tammany Hall. So that's just a little footnote there. But it's still, I think the focus on the sisters is important and on education because that is probably Hughes's greatest contribution. He felt that, uh, that one should build the schoolhouse first and then the church afterwards. And the sisters felt the same way. Colin. Within 20 years, the work of the women who had begun by tending to the orphans and poverty-stricken children had expanded to educating the first generation of prosperous Irish-American Catholics. As the congregation grew, their need for an adequate mother house forced the sisters from their home beside St. Patrick's Old Cathedral to McGowan's Pass along Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. When New York City began acquiring land to create Central Park, the sisters were forced to move again. In 1855, the sisters headed north to the Bronx. At the instigation of his sister Angela, Hughes purchased two properties that became vital for the church. He established the first seminary in New York, which later became Fordham University. The purchase of the property that became Fordham prompted Angela to persuade her brother to purchase Font Hill nearby in Riverdale. That purchase established the estate of the new Academy of Mount St. Vincent. The Mount, a 70-acre park-like estate with a castle that overlooks the Hudson, has a colorful history that demonstrates the potency of theater in the popular imagination. The estate was originally named Font Hill by its owner, Edwin Forrest, 1806 to 1872, the classical American actor, a shrewd investor who built the castle in 1848 for his wife, Catherine. Forrest held a singular position as an actor and a public figure, revered by the Irish immigrants of New York. However, before Edwin and Catherine could occupy the romantic fortress, Forrest began proceedings against Catherine for immoral conduct and a notorious divorce ensued. The jilted forest put the castle and estate up for sale. Unfortunately for Edwin Forrest, the sensational divorce was not his only disaster in 1849. On May 10th, outside the now demolished Astor Opera House in Manhattan, one of the most vicious civic disturbances in the city's history raged. A full-fledged riot that pitted mostly Irish immigrants and native New Yorkers against each other, and sometimes both groups together against the wealthy who controlled the city's police and the state militia. The dispute arose over whether Forrest or William Charles McCready, a notable English actor, was the better Macbeth. The two actors became figureheads for Britain and the United States, and their rivalry encapsulated the two opposing views of the future of American culture, a class struggle between those who supported Forrest and the largely Anglophile upper classes who backed McCready. Working class Americans, especially Irish immigrants, abhorred all things British, including the unfortunate McCready. The American born nativists, though hostile to Irish immigrants, found common cause against McCready and the British. The climate worsened when the divorce verdict came down against Forrest on the day McCready arrived in New York for his performance. The gangs of New York came out in full force from the immigrant slums of Manhattan's Five Points. The riot resulted in the largest number of civilian casualties due to military action since the American Revolution. For the immigrants, the riot set a pattern of civil disobedience that culminated in the draft riots of 1863, when Irish men refused to be drafted into the Union Army. As the city and the Catholic numbers grew in the city, uh, Hughes realized that he needed a greater cathedral. Uh, Old St. Pat's down on Mott Street just wasn't large enough. And besides that, Hughes had this very, you know, romantic Irish chieftain vision that was in his family. And for him, it was all about he would build a cathedral on the hill. It was that vision of the fortress on the hill that to show that they had really arrived. And with that, He's, he worked with James Renwick, who was a very prominent architect at the time. And he had built the castle of uh, the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC, as well as several other notable churches around the country. So, of course, the first thing he did was look for money to pay for it. So, and it, uh, and of, of course, all of this is beautifully documented thanks to the um, 
archives of the city of the archdiocese. So they went about raising funds. And, you know, he was perfecting his sketch. He wanted this, this cathedral to rival the best in the world. And uh, with Renwick, he knew he was going to get that. There's a great stained glass window currently in the cathedral. It's called the Founder's Window. And in the middle panel there, in the purple, you see Hughes. And in the middle, there's Renwick showing him the plans. And then the man in the red is the cardinal who's going to have to pay for the whole thing later, long after Hughes passes on. But this was the, the, the pinnacle of it all. And then was when Hughes went out to lay the cornerstone, and uh, which was in August 15, 1858. And with that, with Charlotte, would you read what you said when he uh, called them together to hear about the cornerstone? Unless the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Venerable Father and Bishops, I need not say how deeply I am grateful to you for the honor of your presence on this solemn and important occasion. To you also, dearly beloved and most respected priests of my own diocese, but if possible still more to those who have come from other episcopal jurisdictions, I return the thanks of a true and grateful heart for your presence this day. To the faithful of my diocese who in the main constitute the vast assemblage of persons actually surrounding the cornerstone of our new cathedral, I need not say that I am grateful. That they know already, for it is not the first time that I have called upon them, but if they had not responded in such numbers as they have done, it would be the first time that they had failed me. This they have never done, and this I am sure they will never do. When any great work is to be commenced or completed for the glory of God and the salvation of men. From when the cornerstone was laid, and uh, it was another, it would take another 20 years before the cathedral would be built. These are, these are wooden scaffolding outside the towers as they built it. But it wasn't going to be built for a long time. This is it at a half mast, and it would stay like this for 20 years. The Civil War put an end to Hughes' big dreams of constructing this cathedral. And he was drawn into the Civil War in ways that he would never have imagined. Colin. John Hughes attracted the attention of New York Governor William H. Seward and later President Abraham Lincoln, who both saw a political role for Hughes. In 1861, Archbishop Hughes was sent to Europe by Mr. Seward with the approval of the president and his cabinet as confidential agent in relation to questions growing out of the Civil War. It was largely through the Archbishop's efforts that France was stopped from following England and throwing her sympathies in with the Confederate States. Wherever he traveled in Europe, he was accorded an honorable reception. He left nothing undone to promote the cause of the Union and did much to enlist the sympathies of the old world in the preservation of the American Republic. Now this letter here is from Seward Given him, given Hughes the instructions from Lincoln to go abroad as their envoy. The historian Tyler Anbinder says that Hughes was one of the most influential New Yorkers in shaping the Civil War in America. Though at, hesitant at first to go behind abolition, which he knew his congregation, fearing the influx of cheap labor, would not embrace, Hughes' eventual support of Lincoln was instrumental and getting troops to support the Union cause. According to Neil O'Dowd, author of Lincoln and the Irish, the Irish would help swing the Civil War in Lincoln's favor, and among them would be some of his best generals and staunchest advocates. Ever aware of the optics the canny John used, made the boldest statement he could. He hoisted the American flag over the old cathedral on Mott Street. At the time, the Irish-American newspaper, which earlier in the year had been skeptical about the war, 
proclaimed that the American flag shall never be trailed in dust if Irish American hearts and heads can keep it gloriously aloft. Nationwide, almost 150,000 Native Irish and Irish American men would serve in the Union ranks between 1861 and 1865. And there's a wonderful illustration here that uh, I'll take a, a second just to point it out. This is the old cathedral. This is the wall around the old cathedral down on Mott Street, which is still there. This is the parochial school of St. Patrick over here. And this, was, this uh, illustration is on the departure of the 69th Regiment on Tuesday, April 21st, 1861. Colin, could you tell us about this event? April 21st, 1861, Hughes stood on a platform in front of St. Patrick's Old Cathedral on Mott Street and before an enthusiastic crowd that filled the streets, windows and rooftops, blessed the thousand man 69th as they marched from Great Jones Street through the Lower East Side to the downtown ferry to begin their journey to Annapolis. That jubilation would be short-lived as the battles left thousands of Irishmen dead. 69th had its share of suffering at the first Battle of Bull Run at Manassas Junction in Virginia. New Yorkers read the new accounts with dismay. The working class Irish of New York, the Archbishop's flock, was flexing their muscle. In 1860, they were 200,000 in number, comprising over 20% of the city's population. Wartime inflation and labor grievances were spiraling out of control, and the list of the dead and wounded at Gettysburg were filled with the names of local boys. Most of its militia off in Pennsylvania, helping General Meade's troops route Lee back to Virginia, the city was vulnerable. It was an uneasy alliance between the Irish and the Union Army. Irish suspected that they were being used as cannon fodder. So often they were in the front ranks and holding the hardest ground. It was a feeling widely believed by, among others, Archbishop John Hughes of New York. Time and again at Bull Run, Antietam, and especially Fredericksburg, the Irish had been pushed to the vanguard and lost men in huge numbers. So that is them departing for the war. And this next image is a very powerful image. It's called the Return of the 69th Irish Regiment. And this is a huge painting that was lost at the New York Historical Society for half a century. Fortunately, they found it and restored it and, and, and it's now up at the New York Historical Society. But the painting uh, was, shows General Manor here on his horse coming back from the war. And up against the background here is Castle Clinton where so many Irish had come through. Um, the painter, by the way, is Louis, Louis Lang, a German painter. He painted in 62 to 63. So as the Irish were coming back, they were becoming more and more disillusioned with war and they were turning away from it. And many in their ranks were agitating against it. And one of the most powerful was a community leader, an Irishman by the name of John Mitchell. And he was one of the biggest advocates to stop the war to stop participating in it. Colin, can you read some of John Mitchell? Fellow Irishmen, effective January 1st, all slaves are free. Lincoln is asking you to make this your fight. You want to end up dead like the 20,000 at Antietam? You want to see what it's like? I recommend Matthew Brady's photographs from the battlefield. You can be sure that most of the dead are Irish sons, brothers, husbands, and fathers. The Irish are cannon fodder in Lincoln's war to free the slaves. This latest outrage, this proclamation, is just the beginning. Will you be a dead Irishman so the slave can come north and take your job? It's the 3rd of March, 1863, and this conscription act has just been posted. All able-bodied male citizens of the United States and persons of foreign birth who intend to become citizens between the ages of 20 and 45 years shall be liable to perform military duty in the service of the United 
state. This conscription act is a suicide act. Conscription won't end this war. It will go on. Three years already. This is just the beginning. The city of Richmond has not been taken. You ask why it won't end. It won't end because New York doesn't want it to end. This city profits from the war. Think of it. If the war ended, so would all the industry. Speculation and profits. Have no fear, New York. The war won't end. Neither side wants it to end. It will last not only through President Lincoln's term, but the next president and beyond. The big wars never end. England tried to conquer Ireland over and over. Our Green Isle has been confiscated three or four times, but never fully conquered. Same here. This is a unique war, and conscription will have little effect on the outcome. History tells us that. So families were terrified. Mothers were frantic that their sons would be conscripted. Anxiety pervaded the Irish-American immigrant community. Orla, could you read that letter? Mm -hmm. Dear son, I take my pen in hand to drop you a few lines to inform you that I received your welcome letter of the 1st of December. And it's found me as well as coming. I hope these few lines may find you well and enjoy good health. I have been looking for you for some time, but it seems like I will never get to see you. But I hope you will soon come home and see me. I heard you had orders to leave there and I want you to ride to me and tell me where you are going. I hope you will come near home instead of going farther for you are far off enough now. I wanted you to be a good boy and serve your Lord the best you can. And I wanted you not to play cards. I heard some say you had took to playing cards. And if you have, for my sake, never teach them. I wanted to see you very bad, but I wanted you never to desert. I want you to come like a gentleman. When you come, there is nothing on this earth that would satisfy me as well as to be with you at home in peace. I hope you will soon come. It was almost crazy about the other day, but I hope the better is yet to come. I hope you and all of you will live to come home again. I hope the rebels won't kill none of you. I never hardly swear, but I hope damn their infernal haste of them. I hope you and all the rest may kill them all, and then you will have peace when all the rebel devils is dead. And I want you to write as soon as you get this letter and let me know how you are getting along. Must close. I remain your mother until death. In the play, for me, the debate of slavery became the heart of John Hughes's story. He was the most, at this point, he was the most popular leader in Irish America, and he had to take a stand on the issue. Would he go against popular opinion and continue to support the union, which came down to the issue of freeing the slaves? Would he endanger his leadership role when his flock wanted to go in a different direction. There's a great quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln that sums up the situation that Hughes find himself in. I quote, nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. <laughs> so here was Hughes at the top of his power. How was he gonna address this issue? What was he gonna to say to his flock? And the whole city was waiting for him. Everybody, all of the, the Protestant newspaper leaders of the day, Greeley, all of them, they were in the cathedral that day. They wanted to hear, what is he going to say? And with that, Jonathan, would you take us through a little bit of what he said that day? And, and when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, fear ye not, for such things must needs be. But the end is not yet. I invite you to join with me in giving thanks to Almighty God for that constant protection which he has afforded all of us as we gather in this sacred place. Now quickly I will get to the topic that is immediately interesting to us all. Men are taught by all faiths to love and serve their country. 
The one is only more sacred than the other, but both have an intimate relation to each other, which ought not be overlooked, and especially when one's country stands in need of aid and support. I see no immediate prospect of the war coming to an end. No end is in sight, and it may be that God, for some design of his own, has permitted this calamity to scourge the country in order to benefit the whole human race. But I believe that this war is a challenge to each one of us. If such warfare should continue for years in the name of humanity, we should do all in our power to try and put an end to it. The people themselves should put an end to it with as little delay as possible. It's not a scourge that has visited this nation alone. Wars have existed since the beginning of the world, nations against nations, and that most terrible of all wars, civil war, in which brother is arrayed against brother. Yesterday I spent some time in our unbuilt new St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue. How splendid that sacred place will be when it is completed. As I sat among the boulders, it occurred to me that this war is against slavery. Not just that sad lot of America, of Africans brought here in chains. This war is about all of us being slaves to a system of government that has no place in the civilized world. I say that as someone like most here who experienced persecution in my own lifetime. We had our own emancipation, our Catholic emancipation, which was won for us by Daniel O'Connell. He was our liberator. For the first five days of my life in Ulster, I was on, I was on social and civil equality with the most favored subjects of the British Empire. Then I was baptized a Catholic and so was relegated to second class citizenship. Surely as people who have lived through that, we must never allow anyone to impose second-class citizenship on any human being again. So what can be done? First, I appeal to volunteers for the army. Let them come forward, and if that doesn't fill the need for victory, I say let the draft be made. Here we are in the old cathedral of our forefathers, named for St. Patrick himself, a slave, the patron saint of slaves. It was as a slave he introduced our island to Christianity, where we have nurtured through the centuries a deep legacy as the land of saints and scholars. We are Americans by choice and not by chance. We cannot ask America to be a land that is less than that we came from. Let us help remove the scourge of slavery from this land in the name of glorious St. Patrick. May God bless you all. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jarlath. With conscription and the draft, all hell broke loose. The war wasn't bringing people around to see the Irish as true Americans, which they had thought. So they figured they'd turn their back on the war and decided it wasn't worth investing in. And they, were, they didn't want to lose their money and their jobs. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not too much to say that a straight line between the disastrous loss of, of life, Irish life mainly, in the Battle of Fredericksburg and the New York City draft riots in 1863. Colin. The New York City draft riots started on July 13th and ran for three days, raging throughout the city. The rioters were overwhelmingly white working class men who feared free black people coming to work. And they resented wealthier New Yorkers who could afford a $300 commutation fee to hire a substitute for the draft and were thus spared from it. 
The official death toll was 120 individuals. The military did not reach the city until the second day of rioting, by which time the mobs had ransacked or destroyed numerous public buildings, two Protestant churches, the homes of various abolitionists or sympathizers, many black homes, and the colored orphan asylum, which was burned to the ground. The city leaders looked to Hughes, who by this time was in very poor health. He was convinced to speak to the Irish community from the bedroom window of his sister's home on Madison Avenue. He was in his sick bed, would not leave this room alive. As many as 5,000 turned out on the avenue and surrounding streets to hear him speak. They call you rioters, and I can't see a rioter's face among you. If I could have met you anywhere, I should have gone, even on crutches, but I couldn't go. My limbs are weaker than my lungs. You know me as a minister of God, a minister of peace, a minister who, who in your own trials and in years past, you know, never deserted you. With my tongue and with my pen, I have stood by your fortunes always, and so shall I to the end, as long as you are right. And I hope you are never wrong. If you are Irishmen, as your enemies say that the rioters are, I am also an Irishman too, and I am not a rioter, for I, I am a man of peace. Thank God these days of rioting in New York have now come to an end. It's enough for us to make a sacrifice of everything, to sustain the power and the unity of the only government that we profess to acknowledge. It's not necessary to hate our opponents, not to be cruel in the battle. It's necessary to be brave, to be patriotic, to do what the country needs. And for this, God will give us his blessing. May God bless each and every one as a recompense for discharging your duty without violating any just laws, divine or human. And that is the blessing which I now invoke on you. Now go home, you have a city to repair and a nation to build. So that was the end of Hughes. And to wrap up, we're just here's Hughes laid out at all St. Patrick's. And then Colin, if you read. Archbishop Hughes died a few months later. His sister, Mother Angela, would follow him within two years. Civil war would continue, but there would be another draft that year, but no rioting. When it came down to it, even after the worst civic riot in American history, very few Irishmen were forcibly drafted. Following the death of Archbishop Hughes in January of 1864, John McCloskey was named his successor. After the war ended, construction of the new cathedral resumed. McCloskey was named Cardinal by Pius IX on March 15, 1875. He was America's first Cardinal. The new St. Patrick's Cathedral opened with a great fair in November 1878. For one week, the entire cathedral was a fair to help pay the remaining debt. When the debt was paid, the cathedral was consecrated in May 1879. For the remainder of the war, most of those who enlisted in the Union Army and Navy were freed slaves. More than 175,000 black men fought in the Civil War, and over 40,000 died. The war ended, and within one month of his victory, President Lincoln was assassinated. That same evening, those who conspired to murder Lincoln attempted to assassinate Seward. He survived and would serve as President Andrew Johnson's Secretary of State. St. Vincent's Hospital, founded by Mother Angela, would continue as a beacon of healing for New York City through the devastations of many eras, from the Civil War to the AIDS epidemic of the, of the 1980s and 90s, and then 9-11. The hospital closed in 2010 due to bankruptcy. Its closure is still considered a disaster for emergency health in New York City. But the Sisters of Charity of New York continue their mission of caring for the poor and the sick. So the city would grow, and here we are, like in the turn of the 1900s, 
And this beautiful shot up Fifth Avenue, it was taken in 1890, and a whole city was growing up around it. It would be 100 years later when the cathedral had to be restored. And they had the big restoration there. It started in 2012. They re realized that the pieces of cement were flying off the, the roof and they had to do something. So a multi-million dollar restoration took place. And the, today the cathedral is fully restored, beautiful, and pretty much empty because of the pandemic. The cathedral is constantly trying to figure out ways to help fund itself because it doesn't have the activities that it once had. But it had in 2015, it had Pope uh, Francis visited and gave his blessing to the restored cathedral. And the story continues. Uh, on a, we'll end the story on a good note. And that is in, um, around the country today, where statues and monuments to Confederate figures in the Civil War are being taken down. We have Irish America erect this beautiful monument to Archbishop Hughes down on the old cathedral. Uh, it's Roland Gillespie, a great Irish sculptor there, to mark the 200th anniversary of the old cathedral, as well as the Sisters of Charities. Arrival in New York. The Hughes Monument was funded by the friendly sons of St. Patrick's of Morris County of New Jersey. And I say that because New Jersey is hosting this show. And by the Ancient Order of Hibernians of New York County. So it's there to go and have a look at down in Little Italy, or north of Little Italy. So the city, as we know, is a work in progress. John Hughes is a key player in that success. And his work went a long way to help shape in the city. So that's our story. And I want to thank Irish American Cultural Institute for the opp opportunity to tell the story. And a special thanks to our beautiful actors, Orla Cassidy, Jarlath Conroy, and Colin Ryan. And to our audience who I can't see, but I'm hoping you're out there somewhere. <laughs> And with that, I'm going to turn back over to Maureen. Oh, there you are, Maureen. Sure and I'm am. going to stop sharing so we can see people. Well, thank you for that. Uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And we have so many comments from people who are saying it's a story that they've never heard before. So it's uh, just a wonderful opportunity to hear something that was so important, not only to the history of Irish America, but to the history of New York and to the, large, the country as a whole, when you see his involvement with Lincoln and with Stewart. Um, I'll just share a few comments before I'll ask questions. Uh, fascinating story, amazing presentations. Uh, the readings were brought to life by the talented actors who made us feel that we were living it. So thank you for that, that was wonderful. We do have some questions. Are you ready for a few, Tarlow? Sure, I hope I can answer them, but you can jump in, you're a historian. <laughs> um, did the Protestant establishment in New York make any attempt to thwart the building of a church as grand as St. Patrick's for Catholics? Well, let's just sort of approach it gingerly by saying the Protestants of New York were no friends of, of Archbishop John J. Hughes. But uh, in some of the materials that we've come across uh, for donations, there were, there were donations by others, not all Catholics, mm -hmm. who realized the importance of this great cathedral for the city. And I think that would have been proven by the place that St. Patrick's plays today, not during the pandemic, but it is the most visited site in the city, up there with Ellis Island, you know, for people who come from all over the world and stroll through there. So uh, they knew that it was important for the city the way that Notre Dame would be important for Paris. They knew that. But I think that the old rivalries ended, not ended completely, but were sufficiently changed after the Civil War 
Mm -hmm. Going back to that painting I showed earlier, right. the Irish began to be accepted as citizens at that stage and as, as New Yorkers. Um, and the work that was done by the sisters, not just in terms of education, but also the sisters before Gettysburg were regarded as kind of strange. But with Gettysburg, when people saw the care that they brought to the wounded and to the dead, there was a complete shift in the uh, way people started to recognize. And then there was just the sheer power of the Irish urban community between the Tammany Halls and the city. A political bunch, indeed. So I don't know if that answers the question. Oh, I think so. You know, that's interesting that he lived through such a dynamic time through Tammany Hall, through slavery, the Civil War. I mean, really at a crossroads of so many events in, in the history of our country. We actually have a hello from Ireland. So <laughs> despite your misgivings that anybody would be up and watching, we do have uh, Brendan Conroy. Hello. Thank you for joining us. That's wonderful. A couple, just a couple more maybe. Um, was, he, was Hughes involved in any nationalist organizations, whether in Ireland, uh, like the Young Ireland Movement, or in New York, Clan de Gael, or the Fenian Brotherhood? He was, he is regarded, his sermons were regarded as hugely agitating for a free Ireland. I was hoping that, you know? Yeah. I, I, oh yeah, I, I, no, I mean, the, the, uh, the writers and the journalists of the time in New York, Devoy, and all of those leading uh, lights, they all printed up and used sermons were immediately posted in Ireland. And many people felt there was a direct link between Hughes politicizing of the famine, because he was the first to really call it politically, that there's a direct link between Hughes's uh, stand on that to the inspiration of what would eventually become 1916 and the war for independence. Mm -hmm. Hughes, Hughes' words played an enormous part uh, and his writings were extremely well read. Oh, well, that's great. We have a, a message here, Turlo, from your old friend John, your old friend from the days of the Irish consulate and the renovation of St. Patrick's. All right. That this is a wonderful work by all of you that brings the accomplishment of Archbishop Hughes to life. We can never learn enough about those who gave us what we now enjoy. Mm. So I think uh, just a recognition that we're trying to keep alive the value of Irish America. You many um, comments on the images that you shared about St. Patrick's Cathedral too. Seeing just that first level, we, it's such an iconic image to all of us in New York that we're so used to seeing it look the way it does now that seeing it in its kind of formulative stages is unique and everybody really commented that that was sort of a surprising it's, to see it only sort of partially built it took 20 years to do it you well, know? it was funny i came across one architectural critic that i read not too long ago was kind of baffled he said well i don't really get saint patrick's cathedral you know why did they build it in among all those other buildings not yeah. figured that there were no other buildings right it was built so far out of old new york Mm -hmm. that it was regarded as his great mistake, his great folly, to build it all the way up on what we now know as 55th Street. Right. But you know, back in the day, just like Stewart had his folly with Alaska, Hughes's folly was St. Patrick's Cathedral and would remain that way until it opened 20 years later. Well, what a folly to have, right? St. Right. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, maybe one last question because of, um, his work with slavery and his thoughts around slavery, but did he have a relationship to Daniel O'Connell? Was he aware of? He was very aware, aware of Daniel O'Connell. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Daniel O'Connell, uh, Catholic emancipation came in in 1929, or excuse me, 1829. Mm -hmm. And by that point, Hughes was already a bishop in New York, or he was a, uh, a priest in Baltimore, I think. Uh, so he had come through that. So all of Ireland were riveted and inspired by O'Connell at all times. 
And um, Hughes and many of his, he was a little bit different because many of the Irish priests would have gone to Paris or Rome for their education before uh, education was allowed in Ireland for priests at Maynooth. But Hughes was different in that he left totally uneducated uh, mm -hmm. as 19, as a sort of an older student. Mm -hmm. But still, O'Connell was such a legend in Ireland and would remain so right up until the, to the, fa to the 1840s. That's interesting because a question came in uh, regarding education in Ireland because, first of all, education to Catholics through the penal laws was very limited. And secondly, any kind of preliminary education for priests was forbidden. So you're saying he was basically uneducated when he arrived in America, and yet he achieved the status that he did uh, through the seminary and through his training and through his own, his own genius, quite honestly. Well, he was very smart from the get-go. Yeah. He knew he was being denied religion, religious uh, education, not religious training, but ed an education. education. And that made him furious. And that was, I think, the main reasons that he went up against the Protestant elite in, uh, in Baltimore and then in New York, was that he was determined that, that he as a Catholic, and no Catholic would, would be prevented from being fully educated. And that was what really drove him and the women, the Sisters of Charity, to really focus on schools, to really focus first on parochial schools, then on schools of higher learning. And they really, you know, and, and the, the results of that continue today. Mm -hmm. And um, one last question. The John Mitchell that you mentioned, and I think Jarlath might have done a reading on John Mitchell, is that the same John Mitchell that's champion of the Irish struggle in the 1800s? I assume. It's the same John Mitchell. Mm -hmm. He was notoriously for being racist, which is coming out today. And even his statue is under threat in uh -oh. Ireland. Oh, wow. You know, that's interesting, too, that you say some of the statues in Ireland are also sort of under... Uh, it's just kind of a universal awareness of right. Black Lives Matter. And what I love about John Hughes' story is that Black Lives Mattered to him. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he started off on a plantation and didn't like it. And so, you know, so he knew, he had a sense of what was going on. But it was a real fight. He didn't go into it easy. It took him years to really, you know, gather his thoughts and make his decision. Well, it was a wonderful presentation. We have some questions whether um, there'll be a recording. And yes, this uh, has been recorded. And Peter Hallis, our chairman, will share it with IAC members. And Tarlo, you'll have a, a link to it as well. So I assume that you'll share it with your um, crew, yes. with your distribution list as well. So you'll have that to share as you like. I know several people said they'd like to share it with people in Ireland, which is lovely, and with others. Well, with that, I think we've covered all the key questions. So thank you everybody for submitting your questions. I think that helped to shed some light on some of those nuances of his life that are very interesting. Thank you to, Orla had to leave us, but thank you to Orla, thank you to Colin Ryan, Jarlath Conroy, and most especially to you, Turlo. It was a lovely evening, a, a, a very special one for us. We're used to doing straight presentations, so this was unique and wonderful, and we've learned so much tonight. I think you've gotten us all down the path of looking a little bit more into the life of John Hughes, which right. the time is right to do it, because everything he stood for is kind of coming to the forefront again. Absolutely. So thank you for that. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone.